Um, the platform I'm going to be using today is actually um, so. When when those of you those of you that have already taken a GIS class or will take a GIS class, uh, most likely will use the the so-called Arc Suite from Esri, right? So there's this this company um, called Esri. Um, they kind of make the what is often considered the industry standard um, for GIS platforms. Um, they've been making GIS software since the 1980s, basically. Um, it's a great software. Um, it's, it's a super good one, especially when you're a beginner to learn because, um, you know, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, since I'm a Mac person and I'm, I'm pretty kind of in the Mac ecosystem, uh, Esri products don't work by default on on Mac machines, you have to use what's called a virtual machine or an emulator. Um, computing stuff, blah, blah, blah. It hogs a lot of memory, so I don't do that. Um, but there, there is actually this whole, um, uh, this software platform called QGIS. I don't know what the Q stands for, um, but um, it is, it's what we call an open source geographic information system, which, which basically means that like all of the source code for this software is is out there but that also means that the software itself is available for free um and so you can uh you can download it yourself if you know if you're interested for in instance if you want to kind of get ahead and even just play with um some of the gis um capabilities and start to learn it um uh it it's out there for free and you can you can download it now um and you know and there's versions for Windows, uh, Mac, and if any of you are, are Linux folks, um, for for Linux users as well. Um, hang on, I need to switch my headphones. Sorry. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I forgot to charge my battery. Um, okay, so th uh, this is QGIS. Um, yeah, freely available. Um, and, you know, sometimes this open source software, uh, especially for novice users, sometimes isn't the greatest. QGIS is one that has been getting better and better throughout the years. And so, it's pretty well at a point where, um, you know, you can you can do anything that you would want to do in ArcGIS, and so and you know frequently, you know, so similar to kind of like uh, Microsoft Excel versus Google Sheets, um, you know, a lot of the commands even and and Notion sort of share the the same name, right? Um, so uh, when when you download QGIS and install it um, uh, and open it, uh, what you get is when you open it is a is basically an interface that looks like this right um and um and so again you know today is all about you know an, an fyi um don't worry about you know you're not going to be um you know assessed on any of this it's, it's just for um this is just for your information purposes and maybe to kind of get you excited about um some of the gis stuff that you can do in the in the future but um, what I want to do is basically sort of replicate this, uh, um, you know, the entire workflow that you did in Excel and show how you would do this in a, a GIS package, just to give you an idea of kind of why we use them um, and, and why um, platforms like QGIS and ArcGIS can make a lot of those geospatial, you know, an analysis and, and modeling um, uh, tasks that much easier. Okay. So, um, so as we go through, if somebody could, for the regression equation in the lab for, uh, the slope and intercept of the snow depth and snow density, um, equations, if you could, um, 
plunk those in the chat for me so that I have them. And then also that sort of helps you all kind of double check. Oh, is that what I got for my regression equation? So if somebody could open their spreadsheet at, or open their lab write up, if they have those figures created, just plunk the equations down in the chat for me and we'll actually use the equations that, that you have, okay? Um, but as we do this, the first thing that I wanna do in this platform um, is that, so this is a, an un, untitled project. Um, and so I wanna save this, right? So we always wanna kind of save our work early and often. Um, thanks. Um, I'll save it here and I'm just gonna call this uh, Geos 212. Uh, 2021, 02, 18, okay. So I've saved this and now um, the first thing that I wanna do, so everything that we have is based on, um, is, is based on our digital elevation model, right? So I need to add my digital elevation data to my, my scene here. So this is often called sort of like a, a scene. And if you take a look here, Right, this has um, coordinates down here. It has a scale, which is sort of how far zoomed in you are. You can rotate it, um, you can magnify. And then um, this here also is telling you about kind of what coordinate system you're looking at. Um, you know, so uh, there's different ways of, of depicting a spherical planet in a planar way. Um, and all of those techniques have, all of those different uh, so-called projections have their pluses and minuses. Um, but all of these GIS uh, utilities allow you to kind of change that. And that's one of the big things that you'll focus on in a GIS class is so-called projecting data from one coordinate system to another. Um, so let's add this digital elevation data. I'm gonna, I have a, I have a, a version of it that's at a higher spatial resolution than um, what you all have. So what you all had is basically from, from this file at 180 meters that I made specifically for the class. Um, but I had, um, thanks bug. Um, um, I have a version that's at 10 meter resolution. And so I'm gonna add that to my, um, and it's, it's in the format of a, a TIFF image, right? So those of you that are photographers uh, probably know TIFFs well. Um, we actually can use TIFFs and, and embed in the file some information about where on earth the pixels of that TIFF are. And then it becomes a so-called uh, geo-referenced TIFF or a geo-TIFF. Um, so, this is my geo tiff of Dry Creek at 10 meter resolution. So I'm gonna click open there and I'm going to add it here to my scene. And here is Dry Creek. And as you can see, um, you know, the, the higher resolution yields kind of like a, um, you know, more detailed depiction of the topography, right? You can see more of the kind of dendritic drainage patterns in Dry Creek. Um, so obviously, you know, one of the big reasons we use, um, we use GIS um, is to make maps, right, for presentations and, and that kind of thing. Um, you know, QGIS and ArcGIS like it will allow you to uh, change how we depict this. So, you know, you can de certainly depict it in gray. You can also, you know, you have access to all kinds of um, uh, color, whoops, um, let's see that. Um, all kinds of color ramps um, that you can apply. So uh, we can pick, um, there's some good ones for topography. So the, uh, the one that um, you all had in that, in the sort of slides that you got to look at was blue green, I think with, uh, higher elevations brown and lower elevations blue, right? So I can click apply and lo and behold, right? I can change the color scheme for, for my watershed, okay? So um, this is great for making maps. Um, it also has this so-called uh, 
layout tool, right? And again, ArcGIS has something that's that's identical to that. Um, so I can create an, a new layout um, and I'll call this like map one. And this is the actual, this is like the actual, you know, you can think about um, this as sort of like, this is the map that I wanna ultimately build. So I can, I can add my geospatial information. Uh, I can add my geospatial information my geospatial map, right? Um, I can add a legend. I can add a scale bar. Um, I can specify what units I want that scale bar to be in. And actually my, um, I'm in the wrong coordinate system. So this is not the correct um, scale, right? But I can do things like add a uh, north arrow, um, and then I can add text, right, to say uh, this is um, Dry Creek Experimental Watershed Elevation, um, and then I can change the font size to make it more presentable, right? Um, so, you know, these are, I can center it probably, right? So um, these are, and then I can export an image, right? So let's go ahead and just export an image of this um, in, in PNG format. I'll call this Dry Creek uh, Elevation and it'll be in a PNG format. And it lets me pick the resolution, right? And, um, and so then I've created this now as, a, as an image that I can then insert into a, a report or a proposal um, or a slideshow, right? And so, um, you know, this is something, this is a very common thing that you all will sort of hopefully be and probably be doing in your careers in the future, right? Is creating maps of your analyses for um, uh, for clients, right? Or for managers or for stakeholders or for funding agencies, right? So this is one of the kind of key facets um, that we use GIS for, right? Is, is to just kind of make pretty images that are of a quality Right, that that we can then share, um, you know, as on, as an ambassador of our company or our agency or our university. Okay, but it's not the only thing, right? Um, and and you know that's that's one thing we use it for. But we we also use it for some very powerful analyses. Um, so in this case, what I want to do is actually create this snow water equivalent um, map. Um, and um, and I want to I want to do that using the exact equations that we got um, from you know from the analysis. And so um, nobody's can somebody plunk the coefficients, the slope and intercept, or just the equation itself into the chat, and then I'll show you how to do this. Uh, and um, as somebody is doing that. I guess what I will say is um, one facet of um, one facet of of geospatial information that we should be careful to um, that I should be careful to talk about here is that um, geospatial information comes in fundamentally kind of two different formats, right? One is what this is. This is what's referred to as a, a raster. Right, and all a raster is is a, a gridded. Um, it's a you know a, a grid with, and every point in the grid you know similar to your spreadsheet. Every point in the grid has a um, uh, every point in the grid has an elevation associated with it. Or um, you know, and this is a, a tell right here, right? So you're not seeing this. This grid is actually square. 
right? But what you're actually not seeing are the locations in the grid that have that minus nine, 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 nine value, right? So um, the, the software is reading this in, in such a way that, um, that it is telling you, or it knows uh, that um, it knows that it reads those minus nine, nine, nine values and says, I'm assuming that you don't want to see these no data values. Right. So, um, so, you know, what's cool about this is that we, we don't need that separate if statement, for instance, to say, if this is no data, then don't do anything. It already sort of interprets, um, it already interprets that to say, okay, um, I'm only going to do calculations where there are valid values of data. So, okay. So the other type of data is called vector data, right? And, and vector data is, is, you can think of it as things like lines, polygons, um, polygons within polygons, right? That have kind of a distinct perimeter, right? Each, each vertex in your polygon has a specific location. The polygons have, um, you know, have an area associated with them. Um, the, the lines have kind of a start and an end to them, right? Um, and, and that's, you know, that's polygon data, right? And often we, we are using polygon and raster data together. So for instance, uh, the way that I used polygon and raster data in this particular case was to, just to create this gridded digital elevation model. I had a polygon of Dry Creek Watershed and then I had a much bigger grid um, of elevation of a digital elevation model. And so then I just took that polygon of Dry Creek and I used it basically as a cookie cutter to subset out only those parts of the elevation grid that are within Dry Creek. And now I can just use the Dry Creek elevation, right? I can, I can save this as its own separate file. And, and now this is, um, you know, I, I can use this for, um, for my analysis. Okay, so thanks Drew for putting those in the chat. Um, so what, what we want to do is we want to do a calculation on, on this digital elevation model to propagate the snow depth from our snow survey out into the watershed to get a gridded map of snow depth. Um, and you can't really see it up here. Maybe now you can. There we go. Okay, so um, on, on QGIS, there is um, this menu option up here in the upper left that says raster. And when I click raster, um, the first option here is raster calculator. Can you all see this? Are you seeing my menus? Okay, good. Um, so, and um, it brings up what literally looks like a calculator for, you know, what looks like a, a software version of a calculator, right? Um, and so, so now what I can do is actually do, I can perform calculations based on this, this raster band, right? So this is, you know, this is my elevation. I can now use this as a, um, as a, um, I can perform calculations on it as if this was a single cell, right? There's no copying and pasting. I can just do all of my operations on, on the cell um, or on the raster itself, okay? Um, so my, the equation that I wanna apply, right, is um, as Drew sort of pointed out here, so the depth, the depth equation equals, uh, is y, so the snow depth equals 4.46, let's say, times elevation minus 7155, right? But there's a caveat there, right? And what is that, oops, sorry. What is that caveat? Where do I wanna apply the, where do I wanna apply that equation? Do I wanna apply that to everywhere in my watershed? Some of, some of you did and sort of found out what happened. Only where your elevation is greater than 1625. Exactly. Yep. And so, so what I'm not seeing here, however, is an right. And so to do that, we used an if statement. Um, and what I'm not seeing here is, is something that says if, right. But I see and and or, 
which tells me I, I can probably get what I need, right? So I can do logical operations in my raster calculator. I have to enter my expression here. Um, and so that tells me that I need to figure out how QGIS deals with if statements, right? And so when I did this yesterday in preparation for class, um, I figured out that I didn't actually know that, right? Um, I don't, you know, I don't use QGIS that often. Um, so what I did is I had to Google it, right? And so um, what I wanted to Google, right, is um, QGIS. Um, and you can see the, the history of my um, search here. So I want to know how QGIS does raster if, how you do an if statement in um, in QGIS raster calculator. And um, the first links that got brought up here, right, go to this uh, web page called Stack Exchange, and it says gis.stackexchange. And um, as somebody who uses tools like this fairly often, um, I know that Stack Exchange is kind of where GIS professionals um, as well as kind of novices, um, go to uh, ask their questions and get help from the broader community. And so seeing that Stack Exchange was at the top here told me that th these answers are probably pretty legit, right? Like the, the dialogue on here is a pretty legit um, dialogue. And so I, I could probably be reassured that I might find the answer that I want in here. First of all, the important insight that I had is that um, I'm sure that I'm not the only person that has had this problem. And so if I Google it, I probably will find the answer that I need. And so it turns out I picked this, um, this answer here was from you know April of last year. And so I was like, okay, QGIS couldn't have changed that much between April and now it might have changed a lot between March 2017 and now. That's almost four years. This is less than a year. So when I click this, right, somebody is asking this question, and an if statement is just a, a conditional statement, right? So um, you know we called that kind of logical argument the condition, right? The condition that we want it to do something if it's true, and we want it to do something else if it's false, and so. Um, Somebody says, okay, is it possible in QGIS either directly or via plugins? So those are kind of external software that I can use within um, QGIS to do a raster calculation, including an if statement. And they say, for instance, if raster is raster one is greater than 0.3, then do raster one times raster two, else do raster one times raster three. And so the first answer that comes up here in this case, um, uh, they, we'll get into the answer itself because this is exactly what I did and it worked. Um, but the first thing that I want to point out to you is that it has this green check mark next to it. Um, and what this means is that um, what's cool about Stack Exchange um, is that whoever asked this question, right, they looked at the answers and they tried, you know, one or more of these things. And this answer actually worked for them. And so they went ahead and said, said, yep, they indicated a check mark to say, yes, this solution worked for me, this answer worked for me. And what's great about that, right, is that I'm probably no, you know, not that much different from whoever posted this, um, Kadir Sabaz, right? Like, our problems are probably not all that different. He's trying to multiply two rasters. We're trying to multiply a raster by a constant and add a constant, right? So very similar problems. And so if that if this answer was good enough for him, it probably is, is good enough for me. And so what, what this answer says is in QGIS raster calculator, the comparison returns zero. So if, if false or one if true. So you can write a conditional using a sum of products. But the key thing here is that it says, okay, so this, this statement here, so raster one 
greater than 0 0.3, right, where that is true in our, in our raster, it will return a value of one, right? Where it is not true, it will return a value of zero. So let's just try something in our raster real quick, which is to say, um, so I wanna create a new output layer and I'm just gonna call this test con for conditional statement. Um, we'll have it save in that same directory so it's gonna actually save it as an output layer called test con. And what I wanna do is, is ask the condition. Okay, so um, uh, Dry Creek, um, Dry Creek 10 meter elevation. So that's the raster band I have here. What I wanna ask is, okay, where this is greater than or equal to 1625, right? Which was that snow cutoff elevation, 1625. And I'm just gonna do this calculation, right? I'm just gonna leave it here because what I'm expecting is that this is gonna return a new raster layer where um, all, of the, um, all of the values um, that everywhere in my watershed that is greater, that has a, a, an elevation greater than 1,625 meters will be one and everywhere else will be zero, okay? And so, um, let's see, oh, that's why. Okay, so I had my, my greater than and equal to were far apart. And so it was thinking that it was too two different operators. Um, okay, so let's click okay and see what happens. Um, and in, in fact, the colors are a little bit wonky. So um, let's color, uh, let's color this something else. Um, we could do unique colors. Um, let's see. Okay, so yeah, that's fine, right? So, okay, so now I have this thing that says, all right, anywhere there is uh, a one that has an elevation above my snow line, any place that has a zero that has an elevation below my snow line. So I can apply my equation only where I have a value of, of, of one, right? Um, so cool, now, well, maybe the thing that we should do is actually just get the values of elevation, right, where, uh, where I expect snow and have a, a zero everywhere else, right? So I could do that with raster calculator pretty easily um, just by multiplying these two rasters together, right? So if I multiply this one zero raster times my elevation raster, what I will get out is a raster that either has a bunch of zeros or has a bunch of elevations where I want to apply my snow equation, right? So, all right, so let's call this like a uh, snow elev. I'm going to create another new coverage, snow elev. Um, and that's just going to be, my raster calculator is just going to be double clicking the elevation and then multiplying by this test con, right? And so when I click okay now, all right, cool, right? So I have, um, you know, you can sort of see that, again, the coloring is, is not so great. Let's uh, see if we can't, um, and then let's, uh, how do we wanna classify this discrete um, quantiles? And then let's, well, it's still gonna look a little bit wonky. So, okay. So here I have like a few contours of elevation. So I'm, I'm reasonably convinced that these are my elevations where my equation is valid. Everywhere else is zero, right? Um, 
So these are places that have values of less than or equal to zero. So when I apply this equation um, to this raster here, oops, sorry. Um, when I apply this equation to this raster here, it should spit out those snow depths, right? So again, that's just using the raster calculator to say, okay, so my snow elevation, what I wanna do now is, is compute the snow depth as uh, 4.4, I'm not gonna be that precise, 4.46 times this snow elevation DEM. And then the, the constant is subtracting uh, 71.55 basically, right? Um, and I think I might need parentheses. Oh, I need to save this. Okay, so this is my, this is gonna be my snow depth. Okay. And when I hit okay, this is what I get for snow depth, right? Um, my, um, oh, you know what? I, I sort of messed up here because I needed to, so now my, my what should be zero, right? Um, is now, uh, is now minus 71.55 because zero times something is zero, but when you subtract something else, right? So, so what I actually need to do here, I'm gonna delete this layer. I'm gonna redo that. And so now we have to figure out how to um, exclude those places Right, I don't wanna apply that equation or I, I want to set equal to zero those places in the watershed um, that are lower in elevation, right? I don't want that minus 7,100 7, offset applied. So what I can actually do is say, oh, well, I have this test con layer, right? Which is just ones and zeros. And so, so if I do uh, four point, 4.46 times my, my, uh, nope, not that one, my snow elevation, and then subtract my constant minus, minus 71.55, uh, right? I can just multiply this by that test con, right? And that in principle will mean that this constant only gets subtracted from places where my elevations are greater than 1625, right? My, my snow threshold, okay? Okay, so I'm gonna save this now as my snow depth map, snow depth, and it's gonna, Oh, it's not going to complain. Okay. So, uh, all right. So, all right. So this is, this is looking more promising, right? So um, you get zeros here. And again, it's, it's hard to see given the rendering. Um, oh, sorry about the. Um, zeros right where I get zero elevation, but it starts to increase as I go up in the watershed and it maxes out at about 2,300 millimeters of snow depth, right? Okay, so same thing for snow density. Let's just do exactly what we did for that same equation um, for the density equation. So for the density equation, um, I'm getting something uh, slightly different. So the equation is, uh, minus 0 0.27 times my uh, snow elevation. And then plus 905, 
or 906, let's say. And again, I'm gonna multiply this by this test con so that I don't get um, densities where there's not snow. And I'm gonna save this as my snow density. And I'll click okay. Okay, so also looking good, right? This and this here, it's much more clear, right? Um, because the, the snow density, you know, you don't get sort of, uh, there was a minimum snow density of something like 400 kilograms per cubic meter, right? In my, um, in my snow density observation. So I wouldn't expect a value of zero right here on the periphery. Whereas for my snow depth map, right? It starts off with really shallow snow packs here. Um, so here's my snow density map. Now, how do I get my snow water equivalent map. What did you do in the spreadsheet? Or what is the definition of SWE? How are, how are snow density and snow depth related? You want to take your snow density, divide it by a thousand, which is the density of water, and then multiply it by the snow depth. Yeah. Does everybody see that? It's the same thing, right? We're applying that physical definition just in our raster calculator. Okay. So I take snow density, I divide it by 1000. Um, and then I multiply it by my snow depth. And that gives me my snow water equivalent, right? So um, snow water equiv. Okay. Okay, so, and, and again, that should look familiar to us, right? So here's our relative density and here's our snow depth. Okay, so when I do that, this is what I get. Um, and, you know, this looks probably like it should, you know, a lot of zeros in my watershed. Um, and then a lot of, you know, it goes up to a maximum value way up by bogus basin of probably about like, you know, 700 days. That's a lot, you know, a lot of snow at that particular location, but okay. Now um, in your... The last thing that you're asked to do in your, um, right, the sort of final outcome of your lab this week is to actually estimate the, the watershed average SWE or the total snow water storage, right? And so, um, so in principle, what I need to do now is kind of sum up or take an average of all my snow water equivalent values in my watershed. But a little kind of interesting thing here is that if we go to the properties for this raster um, and I go up to just information about it here, it's actually going to give me, um, it's going to give me some statistics, right? It's going to say, um, hey, here is, here's your maximum value, here's your minimum value, and here's your mean, right? So that's the mean snow water equivalent over my whole basin is 93 millimeters, right? So that's not that much. That's like, you know, um, 10 centimeters or something. But, um, you know, but that's probably about right given that most of the watershed is actually not snow covered, right? So real easily here, I, I kind of got my answer by doing this, um, doing this raster calculation. But the, the really powerful thing about this, right, is that, um, in real applications, right, and, and as you're sort of probably finding or, or thinking about based on lecture from last time, there's a lot of other variables that we would put into this, this, you know, these equations, right, in our sampling scheme. We would sample different aspects. We would sample different slopes, right? Um, and so, you know, we might want to build a more sophisticated model for that while also kind of ultimately making a prediction in space 
and you know getting our getting our answer. And so, what's really powerful about these GIS tools is that um, I can do that, right? I can actually go to the step of not even having to build my model. I can I can take my observations of you know different sites in the watershed where exactly they are right i can take my topographic layers i can take my my elevation but i can also bring in my slope i can bring in my aspect and i can ask the gis to actually build me that regression equation and then immediately say hey propagate that or extrapolate that equation everywhere in the basin so that i can get my watershed average snow water equivalent, right? Or my, my total watershed snow water storage, okay? Um, so that's the real kind of power of, of geographic information systems. And so that's why I wanted to sort of spend today connecting what you're doing in the spreadsheet, right? Which is a, basically just kind of the, you know, the introductory version of this, right? Um, of the more sophisticated thing. So everything else that you would do that's more sophisticated is, you know, just kind of um, a couple of steps, you know, a couple of levels up, you know, from what you're actually doing, right? So we basically used if statements, right? We, we looked at that condition, how to do a conditional statement in our raster calculator. We used our regression equation to make predictions of snow depth and snow density throughout our watershed. We used our definition of snow water equivalent um, to use that density and snow depth um, to calculate SWE. And then we were pretty straightforwardly able to get the sort of watershed average snow water equivalent. Okay. But fundamentally, that workflow was all built upon the things that you were doing this week in Excel. Okay. Um, but also, this gives you kind of the motivation to see how this connects to what you will ultimately be doing in your GIS courses, right? And potentially, you know, um, for those of you that get, for instance, into um, uh, geostatistics as seniors um, or as graduate students, you know, you'll do more advanced versions of, of that, okay? So that's how this kind of ties together. Um, does anybody have any questions about that? Or, you know, and, and I would open it up more broadly, you know, don't worry about the individual workflow, right? Or, um, but do you have any more questions about kind of the, you know, how you might use a GIS or, or other ways, other questions about how a GIS might be valuable in these kinds of questions? Or any thoughts too? No. I hope you all didn't know this already or have already seen this, but I hope it was helpful as a mechanism to connect it to things you might be doing. Okay. Now I'm worried that like I've bored you all for like an hour. So you didn't, I wasn't bored, but this was a lot of, I definitely didn't know anything about this before. <laughs> yeah. That was the expectation. Right. And so again, you know, um, you know, the, the outcome of this is not necessarily that you know how to do this, right? Um, the outcome of this is that um, you see that what you're doing now is, is sort of like the building blocks of how you might use this in the future. And also a, um, you know, for you to be able to go into a GIS class and ask some pointed questions like, how would I use this, you know, like, how can I use ArcGIS to estimate SWE if I have a bunch of point observations of, of snow water equivalent, right? Um, and so, um, so yeah, the, you know, um, to that extent, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that it's new to folks. And it also sort of hope, hopefully sort of keeps you tied into kind of and, and seeing the road ahead in terms of how GIS and geospatial analysis more broadly fits into some some of these water in the West questions. Um, and yeah, uh, so if any of you are interested in QGIS, um, you know, the, uh, so this is like a, so I'm going to, I'm going to get not on a soapbox exactly, but um, I'm going to share a little bit of my sort of personal thought and philosophy on these GIS packages. So 
our classes for you are are sort of pretty heavily tied to the G Arc GIS package, the Esri packages, which are definitely great. Like, and you should definitely have that on your resume um, when you're going to see, you know, when you're going to apply for positions, um, because companies will sort of expect that. At the same time, um, these open so source software packages are increasingly helpful. Um, and, you know, there's a whole ecosystem of people that contribute to them. And so, um, so you benefit from that ecosystem of people, but also they're free potentially for your organizations and agencies later. Whereas, you know, so if you work for a small consulting firm, right, it's probably spending somewhere in the neighborhood of like $10,000 a year on an ArcGIS license. And depending on how heavily ArcGIS is used by that company, you know, there's maybe an opportunity for you in the future to say, hey, I have some skills in this thing called QGIS that is an open source um, portion or, or open source application. Um, and if it might work for all of our workflows in this company, it seems like it would save us 10,000 bucks. So, you know, so um, knowing a little bit of both, right, might help you be able to sort of um, navigate, okay, I'm going to work for a huge company that can afford the $10,000 or you know, even more, um, not only for the software itself, but also to train our employees versus the, I actually work for you know, a company that's you know, myself and my spouse and we can't afford an ArcGIS license, right? Um, especially when we're using it just to do some very basic analyses. And so, um, so all that's to say that if you, if you would like exposure to or more formal exposure to some of um, these open source GIS packages, um, please make that known to uh, the faculty and to the instructors of that class, because I think it's increasingly something that's important we give to our students. So, so Sam, yeah, how would the process be for doing this in ArcGIS? Um, it's basically the same. So ArcGIS has something that's called a raster calculator um, I think they, they also have this thing called a con statement, which is basically an if statement. Um, so let's Google it real quick, uh, ArcGIS. Um, so, you know, here's kind of the help for it, right? So it, it looks largely the same, right? It basically looks like a calculator for your rasters. Um, and, you know, yeah, so it, it has a couple of additional features having these, um, so you can use this conditional here, con statement, right? So you could say um, con uh, raster greater than or equal to 1625 to get what we basically got, right? So, um, you know, yeah. And, and, and again, a lot, of, a lot of this is about, right? Like getting you all to a point where you have the skills um, right. What's more important to me is that you know about the con statement so that um, if you start to work for a big, right, like what I worry about with our students is that if we're, if we're training them to be too tightly coupled to Esri, and then they go to work for a company that doesn't have Esri products, but they have access to QGIS, making sure that they're not just the specific skills, but the general knowledge is solid enough to go like, oh, you know, like, yeah, that's a bummer. You know, I'm, I'm really used to Esri products, but um, uh, but I could figure it out, right? Like it's just a couple of, you know, a little bit of Googling and, you know, doing some digging and knowing, more importantly, knowing what to look for and maybe knowing some of the, the phraseology of how to phrase those Google searches um, will, will help me, um, you know, figure it out in, in this other platform. Uh, any other questions that folks have? Otherwise we can just wrap up and we'll see you all at the trailhead next week. Um, so for next week on Tuesday, um, will you email us about the people that don't have a ride just to um, board out those details? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I, I will do that. Um, uh, I'm gonna email each group individually. Well not the Saturday group because it does, it looks like transportation is taken care of there. Um, but I will email you all as a group. Uh, I'll actually do that right now um, to arrange that for sure. Okay. 
and I probably could give a ride to somebody from, you know, from Boise on Tuesday, right? The, the trick, the trick with me is just, well, a, I'm going to have my daughter cause I, I screwed up the scheduling. And so she's coming to do snow work with us. Um, but then uh, B right. I obviously have to be up there all day. And so, you know, there might have to be a getting a ride up with one person and then getting a ride back down with somebody else. Um, well, we can figure it out. I'll email each individual group. Thank you. Other questions? All righty. Everybody have a good weekend. <laughs>